Thank you for coming, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this seminar is on canopy plan form. Do you know what that is? Any idea? Have you heard of elliptical parachutes or semi-elliptical or rectangular, all that stuff? Um, that's what this is about. Um, they've become basically categories of canopies in our, in our community. And um, I want to speak about that and whether that works for us. So I'm John LeBlanc. I'm Vice President of Performance Designs. I've been there since 84. Um, my passion there is uh, working with new parachute designs. Been doing it for the whole time. It's something I really love. Um, done many, many prototypes with many different shapes. And I wish to share some of my experiences with you on that. Um, I also love coming to venues like this and meeting people and hanging out and having a beer and everything because I get to see how all this parachute stuff ends up meaning something in, in the skydiving community. I live in Deland. It's a bunch of designers and stuff. It's a different place. And sometimes there's a disconnect, I think, when I speak to people about these things. Um, and that's what this is about. So most of us know what elliptical, semi-elliptical, all that stuff means, right? Um, we know the characteristics of these parachute types. Um, and these, these terms, you know, they're helpful. Help us understand, you know, help us guide one another, guide the novices. Um, we've always had these classifications for canopies. Um, in the 60s, which was before my time, <laughs> and the 70s, we had rounds, and they were modified. They had different names for them, 7TU, double L, all this stuff. It meant something to people. But we just listened. We, we agreed. We said, yes, instructor, I'll jump what you say. Um, and there were high-performance rounds, PCs, and everything. And that changed over times. You know, when, when Ram Air parachutes came in the, in, actually in the early six, or the late 60s, but they became popular in the, in the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, we, we were classifying them. We had seven cells and nine cells, even five cells for a while. And then when zero P canopy fabric came, we classified parachutes that way. That's F-111. It's for students. This is ZP, only for experts. This keeps evolving, but it's still there, these classifications. Uh, when elliptical canopies came, we had rectangular and elliptical, and that meant something to us. And then, of course, with the F-111 and the ZP canopies, there was a blend of that eventually. We called it hybrid. More. <coughs> categories, classifications. Then eventually we kind of had an in-between, so to speak, between the rectangular and the elliptical. We call that semi-elliptical. So this all somehow means something to the community. And uh, I think every once in a while there's a, a bit of confusion there, especially when you add the whole concept of cross-bracing. There's some sort of magic that people think happens when you cross-brace a canopy. And I would admit some of it's magic, but it's not quite as rigid as people think. So my question is, you know, hasn't this worked? Well, sort of. But there's a few things that kind of sift through, and it results in confusion. So I hope to uh, dispel some of that. So my reason for thinking of this confusion is because some of the questions I get from people um, you know, when people meet the designer of their canopy, they say, now I'm really going to get a truthful answer for something. And they hit me with a question. And I often disappoint on the answer because my answer isn't necessarily simple. And sometimes it's not even an answer. It's more questions. I frustrate people that way sometimes. Um, what I often get is somebody says, look, what I want to know is, you tell me all this wonderful stuff about the, how the parachute flies, but is it an elliptical canopy, or a semi-elliptical, or is it fully elliptical? They really want to know that, and um, I understand the desire to have knowledge. Um, or they might say, is it, is it tapered, or is it semi-elliptical? Which is it? Um, I've even heard this one. I know that the katana, let's say, is highly elliptical, but is it truly elliptical? <coughs> and I know that there's a, a whole lot of influences in the community, manufacturers, uh, riggers, you know, canopy piloting experts that, you know, they all contribute to this and, and it works. But I think there's confusion. And sometimes I hear it like this. Look, I need to know what the difference is between semi-elliptical and fully elliptical. Tell me what I'll get with a semi-elliptical or a fully elliptical. What's the difference? And it's really difficult for me to answer that. And you might wonder why. 
I, I attempt to make sense of these questions by trying to understand the person's frame of reference. What have you been jumping? You know, why do you jump it? You know, it was a recommendation from my instructor or whatever. What do you like about it? And when I ask that question, I'm partially asking about the parachute and how they see it, but I'm really asking about how they see skydiving in general. Somebody who just wants me to tell them, yes, go jump the smallest, fastest, baddest competition canopy. I, you'll be fine. You have 200 jumps. Go for it. You know, that's what they want to hear. So if I ask, you know, what do you like about it, what you don't like, and they say, oh, it's so slow, oh, blah, 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 it's so slow, you know, I jump my friends 50 square feet smaller, and it's slow too, you know, and I get a little, uh, how do I answer this question? So I, I ask, what do you want to achieve by changing canopies, because most of these questions come from what's the next step for them, <coughs> the desire to gain knowledge and to advance. <laughs> Every once in a while, when I try to discuss these things, I can see that I'm not saddle, settling or satisfying their need to know, but I'm actually frustrating them. I'm talking around the answer, but I'm not giving them one. And they say, look, I like everything my canopy does, okay? But I'm gonna learn how to swoop, so I've gotta get rid of my semi-elliptical canopy. I've gotta go fully elliptical, because it's the next thing. I don't want to get the same thing. I want something next, better. Beyond. So I, I really start to realize there's a disconnect between how I see plan form and how much of the community does. And I ask you, does, does wing plan form, this elliptical, semi-elliptical, these labels we give, does it really determine the sum total of a canopy performance? You know? Do, do you really want to know what this plan form does? Just this name, this label of a plan form, do you want to know what it does? And do you think I have the answer to that? <laughs> do you even know what the word plan form means from a purely technical standpoint? Because we don't really use the term technically in skydiving. It sounds like we do, but we really don't. It's, it's, a, it's a box that we put different parachutes in, like square parachute, round parachute. It's, it's just the evolution of that. At least I think so. So are you really just referring to customary names for these general categories of beginner, intermediate, and advanced canopies? Or are you trying to be specific? I, I don't really know when I'm talking to people. So this is why I'm doing this seminar, because I want to let you know that you're confusing me. <laughs> and you're expecting me to fix that. <laughs> so yeah, do you want me to put this canopy because of a label for its plan form into a nice tidy box so that you can go, this is this? pretty bow, this is this, another pretty bow, this is for me, this is not for me, thank you, goodbye. It, I'd love to, I'd really love to, but I'll disappoint if I do that. So I wanna kind of give you a basic overview of what canopy, or what plan form really is. And to do that, I really need to go into other areas of aerodynamics. I don't wanna get technical, but I need to talk about airplanes, and I need to talk about the history of aerodynamics before parachutes were really gliding, okay? But really, the, the whole reason for this is to, is to ask the question, why has there been so much emphasis on plan form names or labels to totally define and classify a canopy performance? You know, do you really have to tell somebody you can jump this one because it's semi-elliptical, but not this one because it's fully elliptical? I'm, I understand the intent. You're trying to keep people safe, but is that really the effect, is that really the effect that we get? Well, we'll see. Um, I think people want to not be ignorant. They want knowledge. And that's why they ask these questions. And that's why I ask these questions of myself. But I saw this on the internet long ago, and it really rang true to me in this case. Um, if I were to give that answer, and they were to say, thank you, you're really great, you're fine, I appreciate it, um, it wouldn't really be knowledge. It would be the illusion of knowledge. Now, if we were playing tiddlywinks here, that'd be fine, but this is skydiving, and the illusion of knowledge can be dangerous, as you know. So here comes the primer on plan form. First off, the name, the word plan form is basically the shape of the wing when you view it from directly above. If you were to draw a plan on a piece of paper of the shape of the wing from above, that's called the plan form. It's not the airfoil. I hear some people talk about the airfoil 
but they really mean plan for them. Um, the airflow is something different. If you were to take the, the three-dimensional wing and you were to slice it from nose to tail, and you'd pull those two halves apart and look at the shape, that shape is the airfoil, wherever you slice the wing. And it may be a different shape in different parts of the wing. Now, one particular plan form that we've heard of is elliptical. Now, we use it in a general sense, but in a purely technical sense, an elliptical plan form is one whose shape, whose perimeter shape exactly follows an ellipse, a true geometric ellipse. Anything that deviates from that but looks generally elliptical, we term as semi-elliptical. And it, we deviate from that truly elliptical plan form for a variety of reasons, depending on what we're designing, whether it's a parachute or an airplane. Now, there's another thing I want to just mention before we move on. It's nothing to do with plan form, but it has to do with how the wing makes lift. Um, the center of the wing has wingtips on each side. It's, it's nice and cozy in the middle, and it makes lift very efficiently. But as you get near the wing tips, lift, the, the thing that causes lift, the differential of pressure, it spills off the edge. And that causes some flow to not go straight across, but it kind of goes off and around the edge of the wing and back on the top. And it, it makes the lift at the ends of the wing generally not as effective or not, not, as, not as great a magnitude. So there's this concept called spanwise lift distribution. And it's basically, if you take the wing, let's say this is your wing, and you say it lifts, let's say you weigh 220 pounds out the door, where does that 220 pounds of lift come from, from wingtip to wingtip? Most of it comes from the center, and then less of it comes from the ends until you get to the end, and there's quite a bit less. I'm speaking very generally here, by the way. There's also a cordwise lift distribution because the shape of the airfoil, the, the most of the lift comes from generally the front part of the airfoil and less from the back. And you would probably intuitively get this when you typically pull on your front risers, there's more pressure on them than when you pull on the rear risers. This is one of the reasons. <coughs> this is a little uh, stick figure that I got from one of my old college textbooks. I wanted to find something out there in the media and not have to do fancy stuff myself. But in this, in this picture here, you can see these arrows going vertical, and they represent the magnitude of lift at each point on the wing. And you can see as it gets to the ends, it's less. That's the, that's the uh, lift distribution on that wing. And here's the cordwise one. It's hard to tell, but these vertical lines are also arrows representing the magnitude of the lift from front to back on the wing. And you can see that there's a variation more coming from the front. This will make sense a little bit later. I'm going to kind of back up a little bit and just throw some stuff out there to consider. Number one is that the canopy you're flying does what it does because of the totality of the entire design, everything about it. Things that you can point a finger at, it's got cross braces, oh, you know? But things you don't see, things I don't see, because it's not my design, perhaps. It flies because of the totality of all those things and how they come together. So every once in a while, I'll hear Somebody saying, you know, after coming down with a demo parachute, they'll say, wow, I love that airfoil. It's just great. You know, or I love that plan form. Oh, you're really flying a parachute. <laughs> it has a plan form, but you're flying the parachute. You know, it has seams as well, but I've never heard somebody come down and say, you know, I really love the way those seams fly, you know? <laughs> I'm being a bit facetious, but it, it is really the way I feel about these terms. Um, they're neat terms. You can impress your friends with them, but it's really hard to fully understand them. So you're flying a parachute, not a plan form. It has one. Same thing with the airfoil. It has one, but you're flying the parachute. Also, the thing called this trim angle, how nose down it is, it affects a lot of performance characteristics. You're not flying a trim angle either. It has one. Okay. What I'm saying is that the whole of these things, these very basic things, is much greater than the sum of its parts. Okay. There's, there is some magic to this stuff in airplanes and especially in parachutes. Oh, also, some people use the word platform. <laughs> they missed a letter. Um, you're not really, it's not a platform. I'm standing on a platform. <laughs> but uh, there's no aspect of the wing plan form that has anything to do with platform. It's just a, um, uh, you're just misspeaking. So don't say you're, you like the way that platform flies unless you're flying one of those. <laughs> if you're flying one of those, I'm going to back up. <laughs> it looks a bit dodgy to me. 
brave soul. <laughs> they think we're crazy for jumping out of airplanes. Okay, so back to the, the, the basics on plant form. This is the equation for a true geometric ellipse. Very simple, you know, high school basic equation. In this case, it's a, the major axis, which is like span-wise, is twice what the, the uh, minor axis is. It's just a little drawing. That's all the math I'm going to give you. I really just want to push this button to the next one. Um, the question is, is why an elliptical wing? Why do people want to do it? Well, from a technical standpoint, the true elliptical wing is the way to get the most efficient lift distribution span-wise, which is an elliptical lift distribution, with the least amount of induced drag. Induced drag is the type of drag that happens as a byproduct of making lift. This is this theoretical, like, you know, uh, you know the, the goal, so to speak. We chase it. Now, a truly elliptical wing designed correctly can achieve this theoretical spanwise lift distribution at any usable angle of attack from the point where you get just where you're starting to create lift all the way up to the stall angle of attack. That's a very unique thing about a truly elliptical wing. Now, other plan forms can create this elliptical lift distribution, though, not just an elliptical wing but only at some angles of attack, and, and I don't want to get into technical words, so I'll just say that you have to do some aerodynamic fiddling with the design. You have to do different things. Things, for example, um, let's see, uh, back up, sorry. The, the low aspect ratio rectangular wings, rectangular wings actually have an elliptical lift distribution. The old five cell strato stars and all those old crazy wings from the 70s had elliptical lift distribution because there was so much lift spilling off the tips. There just wasn't much out there. But it did so at an extremely inefficient way, lots of drag. But it was still elliptical lift distribution. Elliptical wings on airplanes are very, very rare. I was looking on the, on the web for a good three view or a photo of a truly elliptical wing, and it took me a while. This is a, a Heinkel 70, a World War II uh, airplane. I think it was destined to be a fighter, but it ended up being only experimental. And if you look at the shape of the wing, the, f the sweep on the leading edge is exactly a mirror image of that on the trailing edge. So this is a truly elliptical wing. Didn't build many of these, but it was a sleek, fast, wonderful airplane in some ways. Okay. The reason why you don't see a lot of elliptical wings in airplanes, truly elliptical ones, is that they're a pain in the neck. They're troublesome. They're really difficult to design and, and especially to build. Every single rib is a little bit different. There's all these compound curves, really, really difficult to design and build. But then when you get done, their flight characteristics, while efficient, aren't very user friendly. Elliptical wings, truly elliptical wings, tend to keep <laughs> lifting and keep lifting and keep lifting and then fall like a bucket of you know what when they quit flying, when they get to the stall. So that means that. The designers have to scratch their heads and figure out what to do if this thing is going to be flown by a pilot. So they need to often, for example, change the airfoil. They may change the type of airfoil, the shape of the airfoil from the center as it goes out to the tip to promote better handling characteristics. They may need to twist the wing such that they encourage a certain part of the wing to keep flying when other parts of the wing are wanting to quit. Um, they may need to modify the plan form, and this is quite common. And what they often do, strangely enough, is they add more wing area at the wingtips, <laughs> making it, in our words, less elliptical or maybe semi-elliptical. Okay? So this modified plan form, you can call it semi-elliptical. It's obviously a more general term, but it's probably more accurate if it's not a true geometric ellipse. This is. You guys know what this is coming from England. This is a Spitfire. So while it's OK if you call it an elliptical wing, and it, and it is, it's more technically, it's a semi-elliptical wing, simply because if you look at the sweep on the front and the sweep on the back, they're not mirror images of one another. They're actually two different ellipses cut down the middle and then put together. To me, it's an elliptical wing. It's a thing of beauty. Uh, Mr. Mitchell did a great job designing this airplane. As you look at the models of this airplane as they go on, as they become more and more advanced, you notice the elliptical shape getting less and less elliptical. They actually clip the tips off, and it's to make it handle better. 
Elliptical wings aren't new. This, this drawing comes from a paper that somebody wrote nearly 100 years ago. And he talked about these theoretical ideas of how to get a more efficient wing. And notice he's already got the, the two half ellipses of different shapes. Often we clip the wingtips to make the airplane handle better. Now in this case, it's not the best um, example because in this case you reduced the wing area, you just load, increased your wing loading, and it does make it different, but you get the general idea to less elliptical wing on your right than on your left. So this idea of truncating wingtips actually has been justified as a way to say that a company's canopy is fully elliptical. And I don't want to make any fights with anybody, but here's a small company in DeLand that on their website, it's Parachute Labs, they say, trunk, they say that a true elliptical plan form is based upon a geometric ellipse. Technically speaking, that's true. And there's their ellipse. It happens to be a three to one ellipse according to their numbers. So then they take this ellipse, which is the basis of their parachute design, clip the tips off. They have a, I believe it's an aspect ratio they're quoting of 2.65 to one, and that's their parachute. That's their truly elliptical parachute. And it's on the market, and it does great things for whoever you know has jumped it and likes it. So the first parachute that we think of as elliptical on the market came in 1989. It was by Parachutes to France. It was called the Blue Track. Does anybody remember that in here? It was an interesting time, because when they brought it out, they said that it is such a fantastic parachute, we shall not even speak of the wing area. Because if we told you how small it was, you wouldn't jump it. It was really something. It was nine cells, um, conventional cells, although the outer chambers had three chambers and not two, two on each end. They were quite small, um, very, very quick on the response. Um, the first zero, modern zero P parachute on the market. It wasn't truly the first because that came in 1969 from a little company in Florida. But this was quite a revolution. I mean, it really, it was, there were some growing pains from this. But they called it elliptical. Well, I found one in DeLand and I actually measured it. I was curious how big it was, but also what the plan form was. So I measured it and drew out a simple CAD drawing. And this is a BT-50, and it turns out that it had 135 square feet of wing area. The aspect ratio was much lower than I thought, only 2.4 to 1. That's lower than most nine cells. But that was what was called elliptical. Now, actually, this is technically a tapered canopy, tapered on the trailing edge. But, you know, we call it elliptical. It's fine. There were three more that came out in short order after that. There was the Pintail by Pisa, the Jonathan by Airtime Designs, another Brit there, and uh, the Stiletto by, by PD. Now, this is my best guess of the Pintail based on what I could see in specifications and stuff. As you can see, it's also highly tapered on the trailing edge, right from the center, and a straight leading edge. So again, we called it elliptical, but technically it it's a straight taper on the trailing edge, no, no biggies. That was actually a pretty cool parachute as far as I was concerned. Um, it, it had a, a steeper dive, it had a lots of speed and a, quite a speed range. It had a very, very good flare. Unfortunately for Pisa, it, it developed a reputation for bad openings and malfunctions, so it, it didn't last very long, but I, I, th I think it was actually a better parachute than people gave it credit for. This is the stiletto plan form. Oh, I skipped the Jonathan plan form because he was always evolving and adapting, and there's a lot of different Jonathan plan forms. They're all, you know, a, a variation on a theme. But this is the stiletto plan form, and it's been the stiletto plan form since 1992. It's straight in the center and tapered on both the leading edge and the trailing edge. So in, to my knowledge, this is the first ram air parachute with a tapered leading edge. It's. Uh, it's still around. Uh, of these four, this is the only one that's still being produced, and it's produced because people want them. Um, the tapered tip plan form actually approximates, roughly and crudely approximates, an elliptical shape, semi-elliptical. Like this little airplane, this is Jodel Bebe. It's a French home-built design powered by a VW engine. If anybody has one here, I'd love to fly it, okay? Just come get, come get me. Um, this is an example of some aerodynamic fiddling because they had to twist the heck out of the wing tips to get it to behave properly in the stall. So it's some of the examples, but it's much more simple to build something like this. 
You know what this is? This is a Cessna 182. I think you guys probably have jumped out of one. Same plan form, basically. A little more mild, straight center, tapered tips, both leading and trailing edge. It approximates a semi-elliptical plan form in a much more simple way. And I think this is a great example of a designer doing a great job getting efficiency with the wing and also very, very docile characteristics, flight characteristics that are very pilot friendly, which is why this airplane has been around so long. So back to parachutes. After we had the Sabre 1, which was a 0P rectangular canopy, and the Stiletto, which was that semi-elliptical, whatever you want to call it, uh, higher performance canopy, we wanted something that was more moderate, something to kind of replace the PD-9 cell, which was an F-111 canopy. We liked the way the PD handled, but it didn't have the flare power we wanted because people were going smaller and smaller on the parachutes, and people wanted to go smaller and smaller on the PD than was really good for it. We wanted better landings. We wanted good flight at lower wing loading. We wanted it to be more responsive than the Sabre 1. That was our answer for people who wanted to have a lower wing loading, but still smaller than they should jump a PD. Jump a Sabre 1, but they were doggy. They were really sluggish in the controls. We also wanted it to be easier to pack than the big Sabre. Nobody knew how to pack 0P back then. And to pack a Sabre 230 was, it was quite a monster. And we decided that when we began on this, this design, we would start with a clean sheet of paper. We would do whatever it takes. We weren't going to be married to any specific plan form or airfoil or configuration or any fancy anything. We were going to start from a clean sheet of paper. So we began with hybrid fabric. We put 0P in the top to give it good, good uh, longevity and good performance, but F-111 everyone else to make, it, to make it easier to pack. We used the Sabre airfoil. And the Sabre airfoil has a lot more potential to produce lots of lift during landing. So we chose it. Um, but strangely enough, if you put that Sabre 2 airfoil on a rectangular wing, it changes the response of the parachute. Um, you know, mostly, mostly we think of elliptical canopies as enhancing turn rate and responsiveness. Well, other things affect that too. And the Sabre 1 airfoil just kills the, it makes it sluggish in big sizes. So we had to do something about that. We decided to add, here comes my technical word, ellipticalness. We added just enough ellipticalness to get the turn response we wanted in the various sizes. And we just kept playing with it. We kept changing the plan form, using that basic uh, concept of the Sabre airfoil and the hybrid fabric. There was other things. We used our rapid prototyping software to do that. We, we call it our, uh, it's a parametric model. It allows us to reproduce new and different prototypes very, very quickly. And, and the, what I have now does it like a nine cell in five minutes. Change the airfoil, pro, twist, plan form, size, everything, hit a button five minutes later, it's ready to go to the laser table. It's my favorite toy because I can make lots of prototypes. It was similar to a parachute we built that was called the Easy Tandem, but it was actually a lower aspect ratio and less elliptical for those that you know, really want the, the, the differences. And we introduced it in 94. The marketing department came up with a name. They called it Stiletto, or excuse me, Silhouette. But then they asked the engineering department, what do we call the plan form? Is it rectangular or elliptical? And we went, eh, what do we call this thing? And you might wonder why it was such a problem. Why didn't we just call it elliptical? Well, the reason was because after going through the whole blue track thing and then the pintail Jonathan Stiletto thing, there was a lot of crazy stuff going on. And what elliptical meant, the box that elliptical was in 1993 or thereabout, was that, number one, the parachute's very small and very fast. Lightning quick response to the controls. They, they used the term nervous. I thought the jumpers were nervous, but the, they thought the canopies were. Very erratic and demanding on openings. Unpredictable. And you had to hook it to get a good landing. Now, not all of these canopies were like that, but some of them were. Also, technique had a lot to do with it. Lots of accidents, and they thought that ellipticals were for experts or maybe for crazy people, okay? And I, you think I'm joking, but when we brought this canopy out on the market, we could see that there were many, many people when faced with the possibility of trying a new parachute, they wanted our firm commitment that this parachute was not elliptical. Well, they would never just jump, they would just wouldn't jump it. What do I do about that? <laughs> is it elliptical? Well, in a general sense it is, but 
in a strict sense, it's not truly elliptical, but then no parachute is. So I didn't want to lie, didn't want to dodge the question, but I felt like I had to do something because I wanted the people who I thought would be good for this parachute to have a chance to try it. So what did not elliptical mean to them? Okay. What we decided to do was avoid any a reference at all to the word elliptical. We dodged it. We emphasized the word tapered. Is it elliptical? No, no. It's, it's just tapered a little on the edges, just a little bit on the tips. You know? It was true. It's technically true. You know? <laughs> Um, the marketing team, because they, it took them a while to wrap their brains around how we got here, they decided that they would create this term, pro-taper. You probably haven't seen that since 1994. It didn't stick. But it was an acronym they came up with. It st stood for performance resulting from optimal taper. The idea was that we'd use um, our smart model to create whatever shape we needed to to get the job done. And that was the performance that resulted from this optimum magical stuff that we were doing with our, with our design tools. And we ended up still having people say, but what is it? And so we said, well, slightly tapered, you know? <laughs> and they bought that. So there were other companies that did similar things. And uh, Parachutes de France came out with a parachute called the Merit. Similar uh, approach from what I can see, hybrid fabric, larger, more docile size. Now, what they did was, was really smart. They spoke in waxing poetic French language about the, the beautiful docile characteristics for the more uh, mellow jumper in their literature. And they did want to differentiate it from those old-fashioned rectangular parachutes. They'd sneak the word elliptical in there, just a little somewhere in the middle of all that beautiful language. Um, and they got away with it. Now, we also had, in addition to the silhouette, we also had a navigator, which is our student parachute. You can imagine in, this days, in these days, we developed this student parachute in the same logic as the silhouette with the idea that it would be a student parachute to teach people how to fly modern parachutes, but it was not rectangular. It was elliptical. <laughs> it would be heresy to put out an elliptical student parachute. So we called it lightly tapered. Drop the S. We also put out the Spectre, the first seven cell that was not rectangular. Yeah, it's semi-elliptical. And the only reason was because in deep breaks with the airfoil we used, it wouldn't turn. People who were jumping seven cells, if they were a little tight in, on their landing, they'd want to do a little dodge this way and dodge that way, and it wouldn't do it when it was rectangular. So we changed it. Now, a company called New Zealand Air Sports came out with a parachute called the Sapphire, and they called it lightly elliptical, trying to differentiate from their other stuff. It was actually quite a bit more aggressive canopy than these other ones, but, but similar kind of approach. And then we came up with the Sabre II. We realized that some people wanted to try the silhouette in smaller sizes than we were comfortable with, and we really needed something with a lot more flare power at high, higher wing loadings. So we created the, the Sabre II, and the name Sabre II was so that we could kind of let the Sabre I get put out to pasture. <laughs> it, had been, it, it was time. Um, also, similar plan form, even more par powerful airfoil, still going strong 15 years later, more than 15 years later. Uh, New Zealand came out with the Sapphire II, which in my opinion was a much better canopy than their original Sapphire. They came out with the Crossfire. And then a bunch of other can companies came out with all kinds of other like mid-range parachutes. They wanted to play with this stuff too. It was an exciting time. Also high-performance canopies. The question from the customers, the skydivers was, what is it? And that all, for whatever reason, became defined by some term for a plan form. Now, companies want to distinct, uh, differentiate themselves from their competitors, so they chose different words, partly because it made sense to them, but because they wanted to show they're different. It's natural. So we came up with these words as a, as a community, fully elliptical and truly elliptical and semi-elliptical, lightly and truly elliptical, tapered. <laughs> and constant cell aspect ratio and a bunch of other technical terms that made you really want to buy whoever's stuff. But in a way, you know, we're all supposed to be experts, so we must be knowing what we're talking about, but, you know, this is a bit of marketing. <laughs> it all, all it really caused, in my opinion, was confusion, in a way. It, it is confusing. There's a lot of different parachutes, but it was quite confusing. So would you like some clarity? <laughs> I'm not sure if I can give it to you. Sorry. <laughs> I'll do my best here. 
Think about what you want out of a parachute. You want a certain type of handling and performance. You want it, not somebody who wants to sell you something. You want a certain general response from the controls. You want it responsive, but not too twitchy or too, uh, too crazy. Um, you want a certain speed overall. You want a speed range so that you can slow down for landing or maybe speed up for a little excitement. Um, you want a certain amount of dive when you point it down. Maybe some, maybe not much. Um, you want, I, I don't have another name for it, but power. It's, it's how much will it give you if you ask of it. You want some range of these things. And as canopy designers, we have a lot of things we can do to meet those needs, but there are six major things. And they are, number one, the size of the canopy or the area, the airfoil that we choose, <clears throat> and I alluded to that earlier about the Sabre 1 airfoil, the trim of the canopy, how much you point it nose down, the aspect ratio, which is the skinniness of the wing, how long and skinny it is, and the, something called the canopy anhedral arc, which is how the arc of the canopy from wingtip to wingtip looks. That actually def, uh, uh, influences the performance quite a bit. And there's also this thing called plan form. So there's six of them, but it doesn't stop there. There's a bunch of other stuff. I call it the secret magic stuff. And it's really fun for me to get with other canopy designers late at night over too many beers and see if they drop a little funny question that makes me think, or I drop one that makes them think. It's, it's really fun. I had a canopy designer once tell me that it was so cool doing what we get to do. And we want to share it, but we, we can't because skydivers don't understand the crazy little tiny things we do on these parachute designs. The only people who can really grasp it are the other designers, but we don't want to tell them that stuff. But there's a lot of me secret magic stuff. We have it. I'm sure the other companies have their version of the magic stuff. The thing is, is that each of these design parameters influences the others. So this is about the most clarity I can give you, and I'm really sorry. Um, you change any parameter, and it affects how the other parameters work. You say, this is what this aerofoil does, but then you change something else, and it changes what that aerofoil does. It changes how it influences. Everything affects everything else. So this is the clarity, and I, I'm sorry. If you isolate one parameter for discussion, pull it out from all the rest and say, what does this do? You almost make that parameter meaningless. And that's plan form or any of the others. Sure, you can talk about general things that they influence, but they don't define it. Let's move on to what's happening now and what's coming. This is one of our prototypes on a, on a project that is designed for high glide. It's, it's uh, got an elliptical anhedral arc and uh, a new plan form, lots of taper on the nose, not much on the back. You can see it looks very paraglider-like. It's got an interesting aerofoil. Um, really fun to fly. I'm up all day on that thing. Not for everybody. But what are we doing? We're building on our previous work. And I want to talk a little bit about where it came from. What's happening now with, with plan forms that you actually see is a change in the relationship of how, where the taper is. Is it on the leading edge or the trailing edge? We started on that direction in 1984. Um, we actually wanted to improve the aerodynamics of the wing by trying to get a more complete aerofoil, a more enclosed leading edge. And we thought that if we highly tapered the leading edge, we could trick the, the internal pressure and the external ram air pressure to fool itself into completing the airfoil more fully. This was my boss, Bill Coe, that came up with this idea. And um, it had to be ZP, but that was still, we didn't realize it, but it was five years away. So we laminated some fabric, some, some stuff on a fabric, and we created this monster. It was finished in 1985, all designed with pen and paper and geometry and a calculator. Real pain in the neck to design. And you can see that the leading edge is just inflated with a fan, but you can see that there's really no inlet on the nose. It was up underneath somewhere. That's on a video that we have on our website, by the way. Um, so we, we did this, put the, la the laminated film on the, on the fabric to make it ZP. We've got this very high leading edge taper. We did have that constant cell aspect ratio that some people advertise. It was just an easy way for us to do it. We designed one cell and then scaled it down for the next successive scale, uh, cells because we were so tired of doing math. Um, it, did, it did prove that this totally enclosed nose concept was viable, but it didn't fly properly. <laughs> In fact, it, flew, it, it kited so bad we didn't even try to jump it. I thought just a little more work would do it, another year maybe. <laughs> 
And we saw the concept on a paraglider in 1986. Ah! And we saw it was patented in 1989 by a British man by the name of Stefan Lingard. This is his drawing from his patent, and it shows the highly tapered leading edge and a big scoop underneath, which was similar to what we had. And then his claims were basically the same as what we were working on. And it kind of torqued us, because now we, we couldn't market it. We didn't realize how much work there was to do. But he was right on target. This is one of our 1990 prototypes. We did continue working on it, but we didn't really have visions of selling it while the patent was in, uh, in force. We like to respect people's patents. This is a 1990 prototype, and this one actually flew really well. I liked this one. Hated the way it opened. It was scary to pack, but it was really, really fast for a 200 square foot parachute and had powerful flare and also a flat glide. It was really amazing. That's the plan form, leading edge at the top. So since that time, parachutes have evolved in many ways and so have canopy pilots. They're getting better and as a result, they want the, you know, those with the need of speed have been going to smaller and more responsive canopies. Which then when we made our, these, these crazy designs with the high leading edge taper smaller, they became, I, I guess in a non-technical sense, they became too elliptical. They became so responsive that you couldn't fly them. So we thought that a more blended approach was necessary. <clears throat> less taper in the center, so it'd be less elliptical. More conventional in the center. And a higher taper at the tips. And we built more prototypes, some very successful, some very interesting. And we saw another patent in 1992 from a company called Paraflight, a man named Alec Puskis. Ah, there it is. <laughs> Foiled again. 1992, he got this patent. It doesn't seem, well, it's, it's already expired now, but it doesn't seem like, uh, like really there was too much done with it, at least at the time. So we have all this stuff that we'd done, and then a patent, and then this blended approach we were working on, and then another patent. Ah, what would come next, you know? The only thing we could think of is that we had these directions we were going and diligently pursuing, and other people d did too because they were facing the same problems that we did. They were facing the same challenges and they had the same tools. So we maybe thought that great minds think alike. So this is what's come of it. This is the Performance Designs Peregrine. It's our, one of our latest canopies. It's cross brace, nine cells, sailcloth, a quite tapered, elliptically tapered leading edge, a very straight trailing edge. Very proud of it. I never would have thought that in my career I'd build the, a canopy where the largest size on the market is 84 square feet. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Booth told me that when I was in college that nobody would ever build any better rigs because if you built a parachute smaller than 180 square feet, it would land you too hard, which was true in, in, the, in the early 80s, I guess. So this was our first canopy that brought a lot of this, te this uh, technology to the market. It's not available publicly. It's, it's an invitation only thing. You can't buy a Formula One Ferrari either uh, unless they know you. So uh, this is our first with this technology, but it's not the first with, the first with this technology. This is the New Zealand Aerosports Petra. Looks very similar, doesn't it? Maybe great minds do think alike. Similar sailcloth, high performance, canopy piloting canopy. So this was, this beat us to the market. It was first, and I have no idea who, quote, started on their design first, but they were the first on the market in limited production like us. But they were not the inventors of this. The first publicly seen skydiving canopy like this wasn't one of our prototypes or New Zealand Aerosports prototypes. Good old parachutes to France again. <laughs> Symposium 2008 in Spain. They had that thing inflated and pushed up against a wall. That didn't make my day when I walked into the booth that day. I went, no, <laughs> again. Hey, you know, we're all working on the same things and we all have different ways, but I really commend Parachutes to France for, uh, for being willing to show what they were working on. They said, no, this is just a prototype, but uh, it shows what is possible, you know. <laughs> Where did this come from, though? 
they didn't invent it either. This is an article that was in a, in a sailplane magazine in, in 1983 by a guy named Will Schumann, and he talks about his observations in the sail, sailplane community, and he actually cut the wings off of his glider and built new ones. <laughs> Amateur aerodynamicist, and flew, it flew quite different. And this is part of his article, and you can see his optimum wing plan form here. This would normally be the trailing edge, but in this case, he says this is the leading edge, and the trailing edge is straight. And he's got a great, a great description of why this made sense to him, and it's something that a non-aerodynamicist can understand. And he ended the article by saying, look, this isn't the answer. I mean, but this is more questions, but I'm giving it to you guys. And the world played with it. OK? So we had all these things that we've just been talking about. We've got the Parachutes de France prototype, and now we've got this article from 1983 about this, this style of plan form. That's the first airplane that ever had that plan form by intention on the design. It's called the Discus. Very, very uh, high performance glider in its day. And some people call the plan form, particularly in the sailplane world, they call it a Discus plan form. Others call it the Schumann plan form because of the man who created the idea. It's been debated and gone back and forth, but it's been experimented with by many people in the sailplane world and in the airplane world. This is the Nemesis, one of my favorite uh, beautiful airplanes. It's a 400 mile an hour airplane built at home <laughs> in a kit. It's amazing. And also paragliders after this, and then eventually parachutes. So the Peregrine in my opinion, has a Schumann plan form in general, out of, uh, to give uh, credit to where it's due. This is the Valkyrie, our second offering with the Schumann plan form. It is uh, a more mainstream style canopy for this that is designed to be deployed at terminal conventional fabric. It, we're really happy with the success of this parachute. It was a joy to design and develop. It's like, uh, I can tell you some stories. It's been really fun. And there are other canopies that are coming from our, our company, and I would expect other company that utilize this little new idea or not new idea on plan forms to further the performance of what's possible, and that would be in, in uh, advanced non-cross-braced canopies, but also intermediate canopies and even others. Who knows where it'll go? So a few final points to, to restate. Plan form is infinitely variable but it's only one of the six, the big six things, which are also infinitely variable. And then you add the magic stuff. Those six things are the size, the airfoil, trim, aspect ratio, the canopy anhedral arc, and the plan form, and then all that magic stuff. There's really a lot coming. Who knows when? It's been really fun to play with. But the idea is that each one of these big six and all the magic stuff, they affect the others the way they come out. And to isolate them to one item and say, what does this do? Um, it really causes it to lose their meaning. So sorry, that's all the clarity I can give you. But the main thing is that plan form alone doesn't define performance. It just doesn't. Um, the names that we choose to classify canopies happen to be the names of plan forms, and I'm okay with that. You know, we can still do that. If you come to me and say, is this semi-elliptical? I know what you're asking, and I'll say yes or no. You know, because I know what you want to, you want a general idea of what this canopy is all about. But when you want me to talk really technically about those plan form shapes and what they do, the conversation loses its meaning. So don't get too hung up on the word salad or the techno babble, as I call it. You know, go to how it flies, you know, how it feels, whether it's what you want or not. So I want to, uh, I want to end all this academic talk by um, um, giving an example, because some of you don't believe me, I know it. <laughs> this is a velocity plan form, um, and we've always thought about it as a fully elliptical parachute. Has anybody here jumped to velocity by show of hands? A few of you? It's to be respected, you know, it's, it's a fun parachute, extremely responsive, and this is the plan form, fully elliptical. Have any, has anybody here jumped to Sabre 2? Quite a few of you, okay. Different parachute, would you agree? Even if you haven't jumped to velocity, you know enough about it. It's not fully elliptical, is it? It's semi-elliptical or whatever you want to call it. 
This is the plan form of a Sabre II. I've chosen to take the 120 Sabre II and the 120 uh, velocity plan forms and superimpose them. <laughs> not much difference, is there? Planform obviously does not define the performance of these two canopies. They influence it, but there's other stuff. The aerofoil, the trim, the, there's a lot of different things. All that magic stuff. Ooh, the magic stuff in that velocity. Was that fun to, to play with? And the Sabre too. I love them both. But uh, I'm okay if you call one a semi-elliptical or one a fully elliptical, or if you ask me what is it, I can tell that you're coming from the context of where the community is, and I'm okay answering that way. I'm not saying it's wrong, but don't ask me to be really technical about what this stuff does, because as you can see, it's not quite that simple to put in a tidy box and put a ribbon on it. By the way, we do have the ability to do a fully elliptical shape on the, on the wing. Um, the red line is actually two half ellipses that we adjust with our parametric model, and then we can get a wing plan form. I choose to do it differently. I like a more this angle, this angle, this angle, because it's more tangible for me. I don't like formulas of ellipses. The other line, I think, it, does it look white or does it look green to you? That's a line that we use. It's called a spline line that allows us to go to a more area at the tips modification of, a, of an elliptical wing. We pretty much discard it all. But you can see this, uh, this uh, velocity plan form closely approximates the ellipse on the trailing edge. I don't, didn't even look at it really when we did it. A uh, little bit different on the leading edge. So it is infinitely a variable. Don't take it too literally. You've seen an example of that. It's one of the big six. I'd like to give credit where credit's due. Will Schumann for creating what I call the Schumann plan form and many others. Parachutes de France for making the blue track and showing us that non-rectangular had a future. Um, New Zealand Air Sports, you know, they do their thing. They give great parties too. It's, they're good people. Um, my boss and the founder of PD, Bill Coe, and his forward thinking on this radically tapered leading edge and closing the leading edge. Um, and also Stefan Lingard came up with the same idea and made a paraglider out of it. Smart guy. He actually put a production canopy in, into uh, a canopy in production with this concept, but it was an unmanned canopy. It was some military, small military thing. Bottom line is that canopy design is a never ending journey. And it's a bit of a mystery, even having done it for more than 30 years. I've built over 1,200 prototypes and made as, uh, over 5,000 modifications to those canopies to try to figure this stuff out. Everyone's learning most of the time. I'd like to think I am. The learning slows or it stops, though, when we start thinking we're so smart. So you'll forgive me if I stand here and tell you that I think it's good for me to not think I'm so smart. I would suggest you do the same. One final thing to think about. It's a quote that I like. It's from a man named Wilson Van Dusen. The weightier the words of academic birds, the less they fly. We've been sitting in a room talking about all this nebulous word salad stuff. And we really want to go out and skydive. So um, I, I stayed non-technical as much as I could because I don't want to bore you guys. But uh, to me, it's all about what the thing flies like, how it feels, whether you like it or not. And all these labels are just ways to help keep people safe. And let's not take them too literally so that we can fly more. OK? That's it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs>